COVID-19 pandemic has impacted everyone across the world. Some people have been more affected than others. Women in particular have been exposed to pressures from several quarters, whether economic, family or health related. The pandemic has also increased gender inequality, undermining progress made on this issue in recent times. As part of our events to mark International Women's Day earlier this month, today's Ideas Yard discussion will focus on how the pandemic has impacted equality in the cultural sector. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, Helena Huber Rodva. Helena is curator of the architecture collection at the National Gallery Prague. She's the curator of this year's No Demolitions, Forms of Brutalism in Prague at the gallery. She has been a research and curatorial fellow at the International Museum Programme of the German Federal Cultural Foundation and was a Robert Bosch Fellow at the Architecture Museum of the Technical University of Munich. She's going to complete her PhD this year at the Institute of Art History of the University of Zurich. So Helena, over to you. Um, thank you, Dennis, for, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, and I'm uh, also very honored to be able to, um, to moderate this debate with uh, our amazing uh, international guests from all over Europe. Um, so the debate uh, starts with a question, are we currently experiencing an, a shock in, uh, in culture paired with a shock in gender equality? Um, so over the last year, culture was hit hard uh, by gallery and theater closings, festivals, uh, cancellations. Uh, the entire sector is um, in crisis, so to say. Um, to give you an impression, uh, in the UK, most severely affected was performance arts and live music scene. In the early months uh, of the first lockdown, over 15,000 theater performances were canceled. And uh, for 2020, the arts and entertainment subsector in the UK saw a 60% decline in out output uh, during the whole year. Um, myself being active in the museum and arts field, the figures are also quite disturbing. Um, around 97% of museums in Europe closed in the early lockdown phase and once again in the autumn for a second lockdown until Christmas. According to the estimates, uh, nearly one quarter of the museums will downsize in Europe and about 8% may be forced to close permanently. And uh, whereas 17% were not sure how their future will look like. And this estimate was, uh, was in mid 2020. Uh, so that means there was one, one more lockdown ahead. Also temporary staff of the museums were not renewed and about 40% of freelance museum professionals have been laid off or not renewed worldwide. Uh, these are figures that were published by ICOM Mm, as well, art markets and independent art scene art fairs were cancelled. And for example, one third of French art galleries uh, could be forced to shut down in 2020. So that was this came out of an OECD report from June 2020. Mm, just to give you an overview in the UK, the output and museum sector uh, in the third and fourth quarter of 2020 was was down by 34 percent uh, compared to 2019. So we can see uh, all over uh, the whole uh, the entire culture field um, uh, quite disturbing numbers. Uh, whereas we we will also see uh, maybe with the presentation of Mia that uh, it's it's a more diverse field and uh, and that the field is trying to renew itself and maybe find new strategies like digitization uh, to, to, sort of, uh, um, to sort of counter this, uh, this crisis. So uh, we will see also more, more precise figures by Fatima um, because we are specifically uh, looking and, and Lena who is also concerned with the uh, work and uh, work situation and uh, care situation of, of women. Uh, we are looking more specifically on the situation of women this evening as female employment in culture has been always uh, really high 
and uh, vulnerable also during the COVID crisis. Um, as, as Denise already mentioned, uh, women face in increasing challenges with the added pressure of uh, second domestic shift. There have been uh, different voices saying that we're experiencing a, a, a severe backlash and, uh, and the return of traditional gender roles. So I'm really happy or eager to hear more um, on these uh, on these suggestions um, from from Lena, who who is an expert in the field. Um, so at the moment, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Fatima Anlo, uh, will give us a profound study of female employment and gender equality in culture in Spain between 2000 and 2019 and will provide us uh, also a background for the discussion with an outlook on the impact of the, of the pandemic crisis. So please, Fatima, um, would you mind starting your presentation? You have to unmute your microphone. Uh, good evening. First of all, I want to thank UNIC and all the National Institute of Culture that are organizing this meeting and to Elena for the organization of uh, the, the discussion. And I will share, I will start sharing. Um, I, yeah. while, while Fatima will be sharing yes. her presentation, I will introduce her. She is the director of the Observatory of Creation and Independent Culture. She holds a doctorate in sociology and anthropology by Complutense University of Madrid and a master's degree in visual arts management and performing arts by New York University. In 1991, she designed and launched the first master on culture management in Spain at Complutense University of Madrid. So, so Fatima, we are, um, we are excited about your presentation. Okay, I, I will start sharing uh, research that we did for the Ministry of Culture last year, and we wanted to see the, the impact that the, the law for equality in culture, equality uh, among women and men that was passed in 2007, the impact that it had in, uh, in the environment, in, in culture in general, mostly in the arts. So we, we made a first approach to see um, starting, the starting point was to see how the Ministry of Culture and all the, the link institutions to, to the Ministry of Culture have behaved uh, or um, from 2007 on, but then we had to first check where which, uh, which were the trends from 2000 to 2007, and then see how the law have influenced some changes. And and we um, wanted to to check uh, different um, uh, levels of the representation of women. One was uh, the distribution of power, how women had access to three levels of power. First one was the executive power or political power, uh, participatory power and power of legitimation. Um, so executive power, the, the executive political power, the presence of women at different posi positions influencing cultural policies, policies like the, the minister, the cabinet of the minister, directors and deputy directors. And then we saw how, uh, there, um, we, uh, how that evolved from 2007 on. And as we see, it uh, increased a little bit but uh, we can see the changes because of the presence of different um, parties at government. The second, uh, our second evaluation was participatory po power. The presence of women in different bodies that uh, for governance like councils, board of trustees, award juries and panels for the distribution of, gen uh, of grants, uh, at um, fine arts, visual arts, film, film and audiovisual arts, literature, music, and performing arts. And then at this level of power, we saw a strong influence from 2007 and mostly from 
2004 on uh, that um, women even over, um, um, overcome the number of men at these uh, at these um, bodies of government. And the last uh, the last uh, power we evaluate was the legitimate the power of artistic legitimation, what we call also cultural power. Those positions mostly. Um, artistic positions at the 15 main cultural institutions related to the Ministry of Culture in Spain. Those are the, the biggest and with most influence, let's say, in the establishment of the canon. So to select what, what's good, what's bad, or uh, what is art or what it isn't. And this is the most unaccessible uh, power for women. So we saw that at the end in 2000. 18, it was only 18 or 19 percent of women were at these positions. So they don't have much influence in selecting or defining the art at certain certain point um, uh, in in time. The other, um, uh, our study also check the representation of women in programs, programming, and grants. And so how their works, uh, their voices were heard in these programs. And here we, we, we check many, many, many programs. And, but I, I want to share with you, for instance, the acquisitions at the two main museums in Spain, the Prado Museum and the Reina Sofia, which is the contemporary museum. And, and then we check the number of pieces that were bought to men and the number of pieces that were bought uh, um, produced by women. At, at the Prado Museum, only 10 pieces were uh, uh, acquired and seven were given to the museum. So the museum only bought three pieces. And uh, at the Reina Sofia, the acquisitions um, have improved on time, as, as you can see. So it seems like the, the law in 2007 influenced the, the policy of acquisitions at the Reina Sofia. Mm. Also, we saw the presence of curators or the authors at the catalogs at the, at the Prado Museum. And so we, we could confirm that there is a big gap between women and men at this level, and also we also um, we take uh, and we identified like the salary gap between how much how much is paid to the pieces uh, made by women and and men, and as you see, it's a 60, 63, almost sixty four percent less. Uh, if the if the author is Spanish and fifty seven percent if the woman is from a foreign country. So that's like the salary gap by artists of origin. Also, we, we check um, the, the distribution of grants uh, in film production, for instance, or the grants for contemporary music composition. And there is a huge difference between um, the presence of the, the um, um, production of women or men at these two, two um, policies of the Ministry of Culture and related uh, institutions. So that's, that's um, to give you an idea, the starting point in, 2000, in 2019, we started with that big difference. And at this point, we've seen that uh, a lot, um, as Elena said, mostly performing arts and music has, uh, at, at the lockdown, uh, almost everything was canceled. But in Spain, most theaters kept open and museums, though uh, with um, a, a lower um, number of, of seats for, for the same venues, right? And what, so really we don't have right now um, good figures uh, about the impact in, in different uh, 
mm, like the presence of women or the re representation of women in the programming and grants uh, in the last year, really. But we do have, uh, and, and it's surprising, we, we do have the, uh, these figures. Um, so we see that uh, the cultural employment by sex, so we see that the employment at, uh, in, in the cultural sector has reduced, but surprisingly, women employment has increased. Mm, there may be some explanations for for this. Um, if we see in, in different sectors, we see that in museum and libraries and uh, have increased in film, audiovisual and radio also have increased in performing and visual arts also have increased, but it only decreased in those areas related to technology and other. Mm, and referring to occupations, uh, we also see an increase in writers, journalists, linguists, creative um, activities, um, also a small increase in professionals and technicians from the artistic world and culture, and only in other occupations it has reduced. So those are figures that um, need to some explanation, and um, I will... Um, stop uh, sharing um, but mm, there are in in other areas like in in science what have been checked and, and and confirmed that it's that the production of women uh, have been reduced we don't have figures about uh, the um, number of works that have been registered in in at copyright level or in, in um, um, intellectual property. So we don't have those figures, uh, but um, if we compare with science that we already did some studies in Spain, then we see that the production of women have uh, been less than men in, in the same uh, living conditions, mostly because they had to take care of um, family or um, disabled or because those uh, caring responsibilities of, of women. But I want to point out two ideas that um, two positive impacts of uh, the pandemic in, in women in culture. One is that it reduced um, the, the digital gap that is one of the threats to women in not only in culture, but in, in for their future professional development that, that had a, a, a positive impact um, because of the, the um, uh, presence of digital life in, in during the, the pandemic. And the other idea is that it also improved um, the networking among women um, in, in uh, women cultural associations, for instance, that, that have been uh, actively defending their rights um, uh, because of the, the possibility of gathering in, in the digital world, let's say, um, uh, what was more difficult before, before pandemic, it has improved. I belong to different um, cultural um, women, um, associations of women in culture, and I've, um, test, uh, I've seen an improvement in, in this activity in women defending their, their rights. So this is the, the main ideas I wanted to share with you. Um, thank you, thank you, Fatima, for this tremendous presentation and, and this uh, really huge scope of research uh, over almost 20 years on, on equality um, and the implementation of the equality and anti-discrimination law uh, in the cultural sector in, in Spain and, and also for sharing your insights, <laughs> negative and positive. Uh, we will now proceed to a more case study oriented uh, or specific uh, insight into the film industry, which will provide us uh, Mia base. Mia, can you hear us? Yeah, Hello. great. Hi. 
Yes. So it's it's my honor to introduce Mia Bayes, uh, who is an Oscar women winning twice BAFTA nominated creative producer. Uh, in 2016, Mia took over Bird's Eye View platform and festival. She is running the Reclaim the Frame uh, exhibition project um, with a mission to bring um, ever greater audiences to films by women and uh, future leaders in distribution, a leadership training program for women with seven plus years of film distribution experience. Um, alongside this, Mia also produces uh, Sundance London. So it's a very broad scope um, of, um, of activities. Um, and uh, we are happy to have Mia with us. Um, and she will, she will continue uh, with her speech uh, and, and uh, statement or main, main, main ideas she would like to share with us on, on, the, on the impact of uh, COVID-19 crisis on the film industry, if it's such a black and white um, impact or, or how did the film industry deal uh, with the pandemic. So Mia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here and great to listen to you, Fatima, and look forward to Lena talking too. Um, so I'm going to speak specifically uh, from, a, from a UK perspective. And so Reclaim the Frame is the name of our audience facing mission. It's, all, it's industry and audience facing. So as Helena said, it's, uh, it's a mission to bring ever greater audiences to films that are written by women or directed by women. So there you have an example of our um, quarterly poster and, and these are the films that we have that we earlier last year we were spotlighting so one is a documentary um, two are documentaries actually and and two are in this instance American films but we actually spotlight films from all over the world it's very important to us that we have a very balanced slate so our mission is basically we are cultural activists we started life as a film festival showing films by women from around the world um, between 2003 and 2014. And that was basically bringing the mission into the UK across 10 days per year. And of course, that's a drop in the ocean. So we decided I was making films. I wasn't anything to do with Birds Over at this point. I took the organization over and decided that we'd spotted a kind of gap in the market, which was to become cultural activists kind of put playing very much upon kind of conscious consumerist practices that we are seeing much more in the kind of eco um, space where people are much more inclined to be to want to know the origins of the products they buy. We felt that actually that conversation should be started to be had in film, but actually to, to make film make to make people who want to watch films aware that who tells the story is a important and B, that there are films by women made, but they are very often, as sort of we hear really from Fatima, we heard some statistics from Spain as for kind of um, representation issues. The same is true, not just in the UK, but all around the world generally, that films by women are, there are less of them and very often because of the lack of women, it's not entirely because of this, but one of the reasons is because of the lack of women making decisions across the whole of the cultural um, spectrum from who, the, who gets the money, who is culturally valued, who programs cinemas, who decides what films are distributed. There are all kinds of barriers to entry. So we are a fund and we invest in the releases of the films of those films. Um, and usually, we would be doing all this work in cinemas. So of course, because of the pandemic, everything switched to online because a lot of cinemas have been, been closed and remain closed um, for a year. Some reopened in the summer. And um, so, our, so this is the second image that I wanted to use, which is the most of our year looked like this, which was gathering filmmakers. So here we see um, the costume designer, the director, the hair and makeup designer, the production designer, and the lead actress, Gugu and Bathoraw, of the film Misbehaviour. So what we have been doing is spotlighting films, 
um, to audiences um, online across multiple platforms and then um, assembling the filmmakers, which of course there's some of the benefits as we're experiencing now of this world is that we can, we can assemble people from all over the world that um, the image that you're looking at, people were talking from New York, from LA and from London. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot kind of greater access. And I think the a lot more um, connectivity, not just physically, obviously, but in terms of kind of greater consciousness, the want to connect to bring networks to connect to each other. Um, so if I could just see the, have the final slide. Um, most of what we do is is in cinemas and uh, and so usually what we do the way that we do most of our work is we invest in the releases of films by women and here we have the French film um, by Celine Sciamma Portrait of a Lady on Fire that was um, uh, the night of an event we held there at the Curzon Soho in London and we are very much looking forward to cinemas being open. But what we have learned enormously over the past year is this great appetite for, for film has, has just continued online. Um, so if we can maybe drop that, Helena, um, thank you. And I will just return to just speaking. So um, the impact obviously has been great on um, cinema closures and, and box office in the UK, 76% down because largely because m many cinemas have been closed some chains have been closed for a year some of the big big biggest chains have been closed for a year so but what we have seen instead is this massive shift towards digital consumption and vod um so basically the video category so that is everything from netflix to watching films on itunes and all the platforms all the ways that you can consume um, has seen a massive rise in 26% boom. And so that in the UK, that the value of that is now 3.3 billion. So we've seen this massive increase. You know, the film industry has been lucky in that we have an audience that are already used to watching out the positives of the pandemic. There are lots of negatives and I will come to those. Um, the positives have been that there's been this incredible appetite for greater diversity of content. So that has created an opportunity for films by women, by people of colour, by people who are not straight and cis. And, by, and also you are seeing films like incredible film we, we worked on called Crip Camp that just got nominated for an Oscar, which is a film that's by disabled people for disabled people centering incredibly important story of disability history. There has been a much greater appetite because there's been much greater space. In a way, the playing field has been leveled. So the big films that are used to being able to buy billboards and incredible amounts of TV advertising and, and kind of really um, galvanize themselves around taking up enormous amounts of our consciousness. They've, the, the impact of that has been minimalized and actually smaller films have been able to get a, a greater space because the media has been much more, um, there's been much greater appetite. There's been a lot less star driven um, work and you're seeing in, if you just take the BAFTAs, which is our British Academy Film Awards and the Oscars this, this year. So the results of those, the nominations have just recently been released and for the first time ever, in the Oscar category, we have two female directors, um, which now makes um, eight women that have been nominated in the 73 year history of the Oscars. And the BAFTAs who completely overhauled their, their um, voting procedures in order to be much more diverse, have seen an incredible leveling out and a much greater representation of women um, across all levels especially writing and directing so we've seen a massive leap forward this year very significantly because of this kind of great attention around diversity and you know things like obviously black lives matter happening and that becoming a very kind of much a greater global conversation um this had this impacted on every level actually um, institutions having a much greater time to look at themselves and to look at the diversity of content, as well as the diversity of who was making the decisions. So um, 
there's in 2021 um i think there is a, a real kind of head headroom for growth and a real kind of um we've learned a lot also around the film festivals programming digitally and there are now cinemas are paying a lot a lot greater attention to the digital space in the past cinemas would see digital as competition and not a space that they want to occupy and now they're realizing that actually it's like another screen and then what another screen does is create a much greater space again for diversity so that films by women the cultural voice of women the female gaze doesn't become something that's sidelined and doesn't become something that's sort of tucked away in a special place it becomes something that's actually enabled to be centered in a much greater more meaningful way so we've seen a real a real increase in greater diversity of acquisition across television buying across netflix netflix are investing very heavily for instance and amazon and a lot of the streamers in in greater diversity of content which is seeing a big boom and this is not just good for english language film and series but across the board a much greater appetite especially in the english speaking um markets for what we would call foreign language so usually again world culture is often very much tucked away and now we're seeing a much kind of greater diversity of content We've also seen a big growth in, we created something called the Pandemic Response Programs, which got together, which gathered a network of women who run cinemas, who work in distribution, who run film festivals. And since June, 2020, we've assembled a kind of, we, we meet once a week, sometimes once every two weeks to kind of share A, what we're struggling with, like the cinemas closed, or we're struggling to decide when to release a film, because the market's so unpredictable and and also talk about when we recover, when the market recovers and things get back to normal, that we don't want a new normal and that we want to, as women and as women with some power, create a, a normal that look that is much more people centered and that is much more about privileging things that are important to us which are which is diversity and greater care kindness to staff much greater sense of community people understanding the value as well but also connecting online and creating other communities in other ways so i feel very positive about that and just to close the final part point is that um we've seen a real increase in diversity of content statistically so we measure all of the films that are released either in cinemas or online and 2019 only 20 percent of of films that were released that year were written by women or directed by women or based on a book or, or story by women that's how we categorize by women and in 2020 this it rose five percent so that is because the big blockbusters were, were shelved and are, are, are being released this year instead. So it, it created much greater space. And so, yeah, 25% of films released in the UK in 2020 were by women and 33% were by women of color, which is a, is a massive increase. So um, obviously we've seen a real economic, cultural and social hit um, across across the country and across Europe, we, we're all affected in multiple ways. But in terms of the positives, which is what I wanted to kind of spotlight, those are, there's a, there's a great kind of headwind um, around diversity and I think this won't go away. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. This was really inspiring. I think we can go back to some aspects uh, both of you and Fatima mentioned um, during your speech um, in the discussion. Uh, now I would like to introduce uh, our third speaker, who is uh, Lena Hip. Uh, she's she's a professor at the University of Potsdam and uh, and the head of the research group Work and Care at the Berlin Social Science Center since 2012. Um, she attained her PhD in organizational behavior at Cornell University uh, in the US and uh, was a postdoc researcher 
in the project um, atypical employment and social inequality in Europe. Um, so um, I'm, I'm really uh, happy to welcome Lena um, in the discussion uh, to give us a, some kind of an overview of a more um, an, an expertise uh, of uh, what the standing of women uh, women currently um, and uh, what could be maybe done so that um, the impacts of the crisis and, and the backlash is not so strong. So, Lena. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me. I really feel honored and I really enjoyed the first uh, presentations by Mia and Fatima. And I think they are of particular interest to me personally because I'm currently working on a project on gender inequalities and contemporary literature. And a lot of the stuff that we find there relate to what you just said. So unfortunately or fortunately <laughs> this is not a task for me to talk about right now i um, helena rather asked me to talk about gender inequalities in more general terms you know to contextualize what is going on in culture and arts and so uh, what i try to do is to find you know something good in the bad you know to ultimately talk about the bad <laughs> again um, and i therefore brought you two caricatures that um, appeared uh, last year in german newspapers and you probably all can relate um, to them so um what you see here is a cartoon of two, you know, two young kids who are obviously in childcare and they are bragging to each other about their parents' job. So back in 2019, you know, the older kid, girl or boy, we can't really tell, um, brags to the other, my dad is a manager. <laughs> and in 2021, the new symbol has changed because the younger kid now says my man is a key worker an essential worker in German we say is system relevant so a person who works in you know services that are considered to be essential you know for the functioning of critical infrastructure so you know healthcare jobs for example uh, communications IT uh, food uh, production uh, food retail etc and so this is, of course, a little funny, but I think the good thing for gender inequality is that we finally talk about, you know, essential occupations, in particular about the working conditions and the low pay in healthcare in particular. The other thing, or the other reflection why I brought this caricature here is that, you know, when this term of essential workers, of key workers, you know, introduced the public debate in Germany, there was a lot of uprising from people, you know, working in culture because they say, you know, culture and the arts are so essential, particular in this time. How can you use such a term to only, you know, concentrate on the bare functioning and neglect that societies actually need more to work than, you know, the, um, the basic, um, you know, the basic to fulfill the basic new needs as, you know, getting food and, you know, having uh, toilet paper was what a big issue in Germany at the outbreak of the um, pandemic. I brought you another caricature because this also relates um, to gender inequalities in uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And here you see two scenes from people working from home. So in particular during the hard lockdowns, you know, which in most countries, you know, started at some point during the first wave of COVID infections, um, offices closed down and everyone who 
technically could was were sent home to work from home and here you know the one colleague is calling the other and said oh i'm working from home now and what about uh, you and the other one you know who is trying to survive in the chaos with the children says oh yeah me um, me too and all of a sudden because you know when people started to work from home um, they realized how intensive care <laughs> responsibilities are. So of course, this is not a usual home office working from home scene, but if you have to shoulder, you know, eight additional hours of childcare every day, we realize how uh, tiring um, care work actually um, is. And, you know, then the question also arose in the public debate. So who is shouldering um, care work? And if we think about the gender inequalities that arose and are still arising due to the pandemic, these two cartoons actually give us a good framework to think about gender inequalities. And let me try to name them in a systematic way. So if you think um, back to the essential work uh, uh, caricature, so these, you know, you know, the provision of, of basic uh, function, etc., was in Germany as well as in other countries shouldered predominantly by women. So in Germany, around 60% of uh, those workers that were considered essential are women. And these jobs are actually clearly underpaid. So, and there's a lot of evidence that this is not only the case in Germany, but in other countries um, too. In, um, in addition, the second um, reason for why the pandemic has potentially increased gender inequalities has to do with the fact that in contrast to many other um, pandemic, female dominated uh, jobs in retail, hospitality, etc., are more stronger affected uh, today and during the last week than it has been the case in previous um, economic uh, crisis. So women are more strongly affected by the economic consequences. And this leads me to my third point also, because they tend to work in jobs that are often not um, full time. They work in lower paid uh, positions. They have work in positions with um, lower responsibilities, which means that in case of unemployment or furlough payments, these women earn, uh, get uh, less uh, compensation when they lose work. And you can also, and then Fatima's illustration also showed this, you know, if you look at the high ranked jobs in culture, they are um, predominantly occupied by women. But if you consider all, you know, other work in, you know, in museums, in the arts, etc., a lot of the supporting work is done by women. And this is also something that we have to have in mind. So um, then <laughs> there is uh, the, the next point, and this has to do with the fact that childcare uh, responsibilities have been so in, un, um, equally distributed between men and women already before the pandemic. So it's women who stay home after the birth of a child. It's women who interrupt their careers for a long time, who look for jobs that, you know, match, you know, their work family needs rather than um, jobs that promise them to have uh, a steep uh, career. And it's also women who uh, opt to work part time in many countries. It's not the same across Europe. I'm well aware of this, but often it is women who tend to work part time in order um, to keep uh, their jobs. And because all of you know all of these uh, factors, you know, women in Europe, you know, tend to be uh, paid um, lower wages than than men. And in a pandemic where pe many people lose their job, this uh, becomes very salient. And this is um, going to be. Um, this has long lasting consequences, of course, and this has also the consequence if couples, you know, this, you know, have to decide who is going to work, you know, in the quiet office at, at, um, 
at home or who is going to um, their, their usual job if they if they can and who is staying at home and try to manage a family life and you know working life uh, together you know the, the decision is often made um, based on economic rationale and all these has in generally uh, led to increases in gender inequality as a consequence of the pandemic to different degrees of course um, between countries and also between the socioeconomic strata um, of people you know low skilled and low paid um, people suffer tremendously higher um, uh, negative consequences from the pandemic than you know high skilled people who have you know an office at home who can uh, who don't need to take public transportation uh, to go to work and who also have the means to survive um, you know financially if one of uh, the household member is losing their jobs and you know all of this is just to contextualize you know what we've just heard from Mia and Fatima a lot of it can be applied one to one to the culture and and arts and I think it's important to keep this perspective so I would certainly agree that you know culture and arts are special and they are not a reflection of the general labor market but a lot of uh, what is going on you know that we don't see um, women uh, raising to the top uh, tier has to do with the inequalities that we see in other areas of public life too thank you thank you lena uh, for this uh expertise and uh, for your expertise and, and commentary like from, from your uh, different uh, different statements and positions i was uh, i was kind of interested uh, um in um, in like three moments one moment was uh, was the networking aspect uh of of women um how they try to deal uh with the crisis um, through either networks that have uh, started uh, before uh, before the pandemic, um, or maybe were started uh, uh, throughout the pandemic. We spoke about it uh, uh, with uh, with Mia uh, in in our talk, and she mentioned the Me Too Me Too um, movement. So maybe she could say a few words about that as well. Um, I was also intrigued by the by the new normal. Uh, how could this new normal look like? Um, so that the, the the new reality is uh, more open to a caring uh, caring oriented uh, professions and also be more caring towards women. So maybe we could discuss that as well. Um, and and the third would be obviously like a, the. The, your personal experience uh, in, in the crisis and uh, you know the fights you <laughs> your personal fights that you have to deal with uh, throughout the pandemic so yeah I would be really happy if you could maybe like comment uh, on this net networking aspect uh, at first mm -hmm. um, so as of now and to my knowledge there's little empirical evidence on you know how networks you know evolve differently for men and women um, during the pandemic and whether men and women benefit differently from the existing networks they have um, during um, the pandemic. So, but I think, you know, there's some, you know, um, there's some evidence that we have or some, you know, there's some possible, uh, some possible developments that we may uh, observe. And this also relates to uh, Fatima's um, um, excursus to the science so that we, for example, in the science, we see that, you know, men and women publish in different uh, degrees. So overall, you know, male and female scientists have published more <laughs> um, since the outbreak of the pandemic. Part of it has to do that um, there's a lot of COVID related uh, research uh, now that is published in a really quick um, way. But you know that the increases in publication is much lower for women than it is uh, for men. And um, so 
this <laughs> brings me to the network aspect that you asked um, about. So what we see in the science that, you know, all travels are cut. So we, you know, we meet at virtual conferences as we do tonight. And, you know, if you had asked me whether I would come to Prague, you know, for this uh, discussion, I'm not sure I would have done it because, you know, personally, I have a family and, you know, I have to take care of my three kids and, you know, then going away for such a um, conversation would have been difficult. But, you know, the fact that we are meeting on Zoom here allows me um, to participate and potentially allows me to build networks uh, to all of you here at, you know, at a much lower cost. So I don't have to travel. It's not so in, in hard, such a hard burden um, on my family. And this, I think, puts me in advantage if I compare myself to earlier times. And I think this applies to many women. So the fact that we can meet digitally may help women to diversify their network with not jeopardizing, you know, family um, duties. And this is not to say that, you know, I think that women <laughs> have to shoulder family duties, but I just think, you know, this in the structure that we still have today, um, paid and unpaid work uh, duties are um, divided very differently between men and women. So maybe one <laughs> word of caution on this optimistic view is that I still think it's often hard, you know, to build networks electronically via Zoom uh, in the same way that you can build them when you meet in person. So, you know, maybe, you know, after we have finished the discussion, we would have still stuck around and have a drink or something. And of course, this brings people closer together. So um, all this is, is to say we have the potential for women to expand uh, their networks uh, due to the pandemic, but at the same time, maybe the quality of the networks and the connections that we make, you know, may not be the same as, you know, if we met in person. You want me to uh, go on with the no, other no, question? No, no. Uh, maybe, you know. No, 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 yeah. maybe I would maybe ask Mia, but just like a quick, quick comment, you know, that the uh, Maybe the this networking uh, sometimes it will, it never happened like this in person networking for women because in the conference it says it's it's often being said that it's like some kind of a men's club you know and that the women are then not anyways like taken into the club so maybe that makes well I mean could make the potential uh, of this networking even stronger but yeah I would love to hear something more from Mia on this networking aspect, also maybe on this uh, aspect of intersectionality, if we're, if this uh, different sort of movements can like uh, strengthen each other. Yeah, I definitely think, I mean, it was something that we were doing before. I mean, post Me Too, you know, film had a very big reckoning with itself around, around equality, around gender, around, you know, sexual violence and who was disproportionately affected by that. So, you know, lots came out of it and a lot of that was uni uni unifying networks. So we already had the kind of groups and connections that were sort of being facilitated from 2018. But during the pandemic, what we found is we've all reached out to each other much more significantly. I agree with Lena about the point about it's it's wonderful because access means that you can do all of this from home and you can do it whilst having caring duties and a family and especially if you're not living in London you know in the UK you know people who are you know there's people running cinemas all over the country but the film industry is disproportionately London based and that's a massive problem so what obviously we found is these networks are truly nationwide now and it means that everyone can get access and so that's a wonderful part, part of the technological advancement. I agree though that the, the these kind of networks and what we're working on doing is facilitating them so that you do build in time to have time after the discussions that replicate what happens in real life which is you may go to the bar which is a very English thing to do um, and that you that you have some looser time like I think the digital space can work but it needs facilitation and so I feel kind of very positive about that because I think there's a real leveling up you know also people can't afford to travel people who can't travel because of disability 
you know, there's lots of people that can't get around in the, and, and, and we're all learning how they used to live and how our networks were inaccessible to them. And now they're accessible. And I think that's a really wonderful thing. Great, thank you. Fatima, would you like to comment because you mentioned that aspect as well? Yes, uh, well, first of all, I completely agree with Lena. Uh, there are some structural um, uh, inequalities that have been um, exposed now uh, under crisis. Uh, and that is not only related to culture, but society in general, and all this difference between uh, the essential workers, or um, it's completely the same in Spain, and I, I, I would. But those are uh, structural differences that um, um, have reflection in culture, uh, and as I said, I, I, we've seen that um, the, the percentage of women working have increased, but this is probably because there are more women that are working in the arts or in culture that are not, not registered, for instance, but we don't know, it's just an hypothesis. Uh, there's also less freelance women and they, they try to, to find that stability as a, um, a civil servants or positions in museums or archives, though they are lower paid or lower positions or less stable and the high positions, those that program and define uh, what has to be done and, and and the meaning is um, our men, right? So I completely agree with the, uh, her reflections. And regarding networking, what I've seen um, is um, within organizations that were already established for the, um, as an activist for uh, women in the arts or women in culture, uh, they have become stronger and we were more connected uh, because as Lena and Mia said, I mean, it's, it's more accessible. And for new normality, probably um, we've seen, because I, I see a big difference between the lockdown when, when children were at home and the second phase here in Spain where children, we were working from home, but children were at school. Then women found that they can work from home, they can save some time, that they, they, they are overwhelmed with, with um, homework, but then they can save time. So uh, probably we will find a, a balance uh, and we can stay we don't have to work so many days to to our work and uh, working in presence, but maybe a balance will will help some women. But um, the the study the, the impact on um, because of the distribution of responsibilities uh, at home and that uh, in our families and in society, also taking care of the elderly. And um, because that will take some time to change, unfortunately, what it has an impact is in the production, in the production of content. And in, it, it's in, in, in the Ministry of uh, Science and, and Innovation in Spain, they did the research, very thorough research and they, they found four groups, mm, uh, men with, with other responsibilities or not, with children or, mm, and women. Um, and they found that those who increase more their production were men with uh, mm, living uh, in families, with uh, either children or uh, elder um, uh, staying at home. Then women 
with children uh, um, have the second level of production and those with less production were then uh, the third position were women um, with no resp other responsibilities and the fourth uh, in science production were men with no responsibilities. So meaning that the logistics of life uh, somehow has an impact. So if you share that logistics, either you are men or women, then you, you have mm, better uh, mm, production. While if you are alone and you don't have uh, maybe to take care of third parties, but you have to take care of your own logistics, then, and you cannot share that, that it has an impact on production. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sure that this will transfer to culture, but we don't have the figures, right? Mm -hmm. And that is very, very difficult to change because that goes directly to uh, the, the um, uh, culture uh, that we live in. In, in terms of distribution of, of responsibilities, and that will be hard to change. Thank you. Um, like, I think this was uh, really interesting. I would maybe follow up with this question of how this new normal should look like, you know? If we can make more productive this shared logistics, you know? If we should uh, try to keep this home office that enabled us this shared logistics um how can we get more appreciation for the for these burdens you know the women have been taking on the uh, carrying on their shoulders for these different cares if we can gain maybe more power based or retain at least retain our power and positions you know like by argumenting Mm, that the new new normal should be more caring and more open towards women. Mm, and what do you think about like activism and, and approaches in, in activism? You know, how, how women could make, actually like make their voice be heard once again, because like from all of you, most of the figures were negative, you know, for, uh, to, towards women. So where would you see maybe the possibilities to strengthen women um, after this crisis in this new normal? If it's possible to achieve like some kind of a system change or do we have to, you know, just like, um, yeah, try uh, our hearts to keep our, our own positions or uh, yeah, what, what, our network or what would you, would you, would you see as relevant? Who wants to start? Shall I start? Um, I, I mean, I think because we've been assembling the, this network of it's nearly 70 women who run cinemas, distribution companies, film festivals in the UK. What we found is like everyone sort of sharing their kind of weekly um, position at work, but also at home. And I think what we're so that's really useful because it means that, you know, we're taking a kind of the temperature of the industry very carefully. And what we found is that there's a much greater kind of privileging of how people are feeling and and what they're going through and that being there they're not being any shame like none of the women i speak to i can't speak for other networks but certainly the network that i'm part of you know i feel like people are centering kindness a lot more a lot more um understanding when people have caring responsibilities when people are caring for someone who is sick caring uh, homeschooling children which is of course incredibly um restrictive often if you're homeschooling children and trying to work that actually people are talking about and these are managers as well that i'm talking about they're all these are high level individuals who are talking about wanting to run much kinder working practice um that also that gets the best out of people but also makes people feel proud of working for these organizations and feel looked after those and and also we're talking a lot about um sharing um resources as well that you know each you know if you're talking about we're talking about maybe 40 cinemas in our network that you know each that if we can share resources we don't all need to like buy and set up our own vod players for instance that we're sharing a lot of a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding and a lot of systems so that's all come out of you know 
having the time and the connectivity to speak regularly. And so in a way that's, that is a kind of activist network or where the sort of activist framework and within that sits various organizations. So I think, you know, we will continue to kind of privilege those voices when we return back to cinemas opening and people being able to gather that, that that's important for us to carry on because I think we need people-centered approach, not profits. That's what we've learned this past year. It's much more important. I, I would like to, to bring in an issue here because that, that's why I think it's very important, this opportunity to improve and strengthen our uh, connectivity and for activism and is uh, we've seen uh, the influence of uh, women's association the arts uh, on the policy at the Ministry of Culture and the application of the equality law that was passed in 2007 and I want to bring in uh, the idea of the affirmative action or quotas and our research showed that, um, for instance, the distribution of grants uh, at the Institute of Film and Audiovisual Arts, for instance, and, and in other areas we research, it's very important to, to um, uh, reach what the law established at parity, we say parity, which is a distribution of at least 60-40. Uh, either in programming, either in distribution of grants, presence of women at uh, governance bodies in, in terms of part participation. And I think that uh, not because of the pandemic, but if we keep an eye, because now th that research, for instance, was done because of the pressure of these associations of the Ministry of Culture. Uh, so I think it's very important to, gener to, to um, have that pressure on policies for affirmative action, because we've seen uh, mostly in, in, in films and, and, uh, and audiovisual policies, the changes that are being um, or happening just because the application of this affirmative action and the quotas in the distribution of grants or the programming at different levels. So I, uh, I think it's important to uh, strengthen that activism because it has the pressure on, on policies for equality in, in um, women in, in culture. I can totally uh, second Fatima's point that we really should use the momentum uh, now that we talk about these um, inequalities to a much higher degree than we did pre-pandemic. But if you ask about the new normal, you know, <laughs> um, I think the image that I have of how it should be and how it will be does not necessarily uh, overlap so much. So what I think it should be is that, you know, the awareness of, you know, the burden that care uh, responsibilities put uh, on the shoulders on predominantly um, women, that, you know, this should be carried over after the pandemic so that we, you know, also men take over um, bigger shares in care work. So what we saw in many countries and, you know, the data that I know best is for Germany and the US is that men indeed shouldered more care <laughs> responsibilities um, during the first wave of the pandemic. But this engagement was temporarily, it went back and we are almost back to the level that we were pre-pandemic. So it's not, and you know, the, there is still a huge uh, care burden, of course. So um, I don't necessarily think that this uh, will um, happen also it should and the same applies a little bit to you know options to work from home to work remotely which you know may also facilitate the um, the reconciliation between paid and unpaid work but you know I think 
as soon as things get back to normal, you know, um, networking um, is made, you know, in person at events, at conferences, you need to go to talk to people, you need to be seen so that other people think of you and ask you, you know, to, um, you know, to participate in, you know, any networking events or, you know, in any engagement. So, and I think this is the big um, danger for women. So, you know, if we uh, <laughs> sit to sit at home to greater degrees, and this applies to the entire labor market, I think, than men, I think we, we will become even more invisible that we already are now. And so I think there is the opportunity, of course, to, you know, to think differently about work due to everything that we've been through. But we have to be careful that it doesn't backfire and actually increases uh, gender inequalities to a higher degree. So if you mean that uh, if the home office big came the new normal meaning the women that women would uh, take account uh, take like more much more home office than men then they would be in more uh, in more danger of basically like losing um, um, the the contacts and, and the networks if, if I understood correctly yes <laughs> So this might not apply to the same degree to you know the entire labor market but you know if you think about you know office uh, work if you're not there if you are not seen you're not considered for a promotion and i think this works like this in other areas of the labor market uh, too mm -hmm. yeah okay so yeah i think it's it's really interesting i think we now uh, are coming to 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 the to the closing of our discussion um i think we have um, we have seen like interesting positions uh, how uh, women uh, and women in culture through their already existing initiatives uh, can strengthen each other um, and uh, how how these women can maybe use the momentum uh, to argument for more um, <laughs> more sensitive approach um, on the on the workplace and and to maybe towards uh, uh, and and more sensitive approach uh, towards the working culture um, in general, and we have also seen uh, a little bit critical um, critical um, opinion uh, on on Lena that uh, if if uh, if home office uh, dominates the life of women, they will be pushed back to the domestic environment again, um, and maybe. And maybe, uh, yeah, and, and, and Fatima mentioned that it would be wonderful to have more activist approach and, and maybe to achieve uh, more affirmative uh, action and, and, and quotas uh, so that we can uh, retain, mm, retain uh, or, or secure women's positions uh, in, the, in the new normal. Um, I would maybe now uh, ask you if you have uh, something else to add or some kind of a final final statement or um, or a conclusion uh, on the debate or that some some thoughts you would like to share um, the, there is just something that that um, I I don't think this pandemic will completely change the future and some some possibilities uh, came up with the pandemic and others uh, but what what i really want to to point out is the threat for the future professional uh, development of women is the the digital and technology gap and at that point, this experience have provided uh, women with at least the, the um, uh, to, to be more aware of that uh, threat that is not only in culture, but in general, and that has been uh, recognized by the uh, World Gender 
uh, GAP um, forum and other uh, organizations. And I think that that will have uh, at least a good impact because even people that were completely out of the experience of the digital world uh, were forced to, to came into it. So that will probably open the awareness for that threat for, uh, for women. Thank you for the, for the remark. Um, I think we can conclude. I would uh, very, very much uh, thank to, to all of our guest speakers uh, for their presentations and, and insights uh, into the, into the fields of uh, and, and uh, of culture and and the expertise their expertise i would also like to thank the the organizing institutes the Goethe institute the british council uh, culture centers and institute cervantes and uh, yeah and and i hope uh, i will have the chance to network with you and <laughs> meet some meet some of you also in, in in the future so that we can discuss maybe some some of the issues we we brought up Thank you. I really enjoyed that. It was lovely to meet everyone. Um, yes, thank you for my part too. I really enjoyed the conversation and hope uh, you did so too. Yes, thank you very much to Elena and all the institutes that organized this meeting and to Mia and Lina for, for their conversation and their ideas. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, you too. Bye. <laughs>